Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks to the jQuery conference and Adam for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so today I want to talk to you about uh, components. I cannot see you guys because of these lights, so I might be squinting. Uh, but <clears throat> first, let me talk a little bit about myself. Uh, my Twitter handle is Dave Errol. Um, feel free to follow me. I'd like to be friends. Um, uh, tweet about the, the good and the bad of the talk. Uh, I can take it. Um, I live in Chicago uh, here. Um, I love Chicago. It's a great city. How many of you guys are from Chicago? Most of you, yeah. Um, great city, right? Tremendous food, great people, obviously. Um, except for the winters, maybe. But um, I work for a company called, oops, sorry. Work for a company called Belly. Um, actually, that's not true. I formerly left, formerly Belly. I left about two weeks ago uh, to pursue starting my own business. Uh, yeah, I made that jump. Currently coming to you employed by the government. I'm just kidding. So um, if you don't know, who's used Belly? A couple of you guys. I'd expect more. Uh, we're based in Chicago. Um, if you don't know Belly, we, uh, we install iPad apps like this um, all around the country. Um, we've got a really great engineering team. Uh, well, they did until I left. Um, <laughs> But my primary role there was to build uh, uh, an HTML5 hybrid application. And this is what really got me into web components, um, sort of the idea about web components at least, because when I sat down and thought about how to build this and um, something that would last us for years um, and really grow with the, the way that we wanted to even introduce third party um, widgets uh, through our API, um, I thought about componentizing everything. And this was before you know, I was really diving into any kind of specs. I'm sure Google was sort of working on it, but I hadn't heard of it. Um, but the idea really rang with me, and I, I loved it. And when I, when I heard about the spec, I was really into it. Uh, but like I said, uh, I left Belly two weeks ago, so now I'm free, um, more like alone. Uh, but so you might be wondering about what this talk is. Is it the, is it the Shadow DOM? Um, is it Coolio, Tupac? Uh, maybe even the Bible, um, as I walk through the valley, you know, of what? And, uh, but it's, it's really just an overview of uh, web components themselves. I, I want to take a look at that and what the, the future looks like um, with web components. And it's really an argument for its usefulness. Uh, what it's not is a tutorial. I don't want to necessarily dive into too much of the code. We'll look at the code. Um, I, I, I won't live code, because you wouldn't want me to live code. Um, but I, I do want to uh, show you what that's going to look like. Um, and it's also an argument for its usefulness, or it's not, sorry, it's not an argument uh, for whether components is ready for production. Um, I'll let other people do that. I do think that there's, uh, there's value on any level of um, introducing sort of the paradigm into your code base or utilizing one of the frameworks that are, are sort of migrating that way. But first, let's take a look at the history of the componentized web. Let's go all the way back to 1999. Coolio was still living in gangster's paradise uh, before he lost all of his hair. Um, the world was still sober uh, about the loss of um, one of the greatest rappers in history, uh, but also fearing the impending Y2K. Google, who's been leading a lot of this web component stuff, was still in beta you can believe that. Um, and this guy, Bill Gates, CEO of Microsoft, richest man at the time, pretty much still the richest man now. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but was brutally attacked that year in Brussels, Belgium, by a pie, a cream pie. But he got himself together, and he came out with Windows 98 <clears throat> um, <laughs> in the cloud, apparently. They were before their time. Um, in Windows 98, uh, it came with IE 5.5. Yeah, yeah, woo! At the time, it was probably pretty exciting. Uh, this was before everyone was fearing and loathing IE. Um, we still kind of, they were, they were actually innovating. And during that time, they came up with a really interesting spec. This was 1998. They came up with a spec called HTML Component. You guys might be familiar with this. You might have seen the .htc syntax, and I'm sure most of you guys, ooh, if you have seen that. Uh, Microsoft, especially IE, isn't necessarily known for their execution, uh, but they do innovate. And their four, their four uh, 
eyesight, whatever, is uh, for this sort of particular thing was um, quite astounding, I think. Uh, if you read the abstract of that spec, it says uh, the, well, it says the growth of HTML and scripting as an application platform has exploded recently. This was 1998. One limiting factor of this growth is that there is no way to formalize the services that an HTML application can provide or to allow them to be reused as components in other HTML page or application. Componentization is a powerful paradigm that allows components to use uh, users to build applications using building blocks of functionality without having to implement those building blocks themselves or necessarily understand how the building works in fine detail. This method makes building complex applications easier by breaking them down into manageable chunks and allowing the building blocks to be reused in other applications. This was quite profound for 1998, particularly for the web. <clears throat> the web was sort of not quite ready for that. Uh, keep in mind that less than 50% of adults even used the internet at that time. It was uh, quite new. And most of us, if we were building websites at that time, were probably concerned about our enter pages <laughs> that go to our animated GIF home pages. So we had better things to worry about, obviously. But thankfully, eight years later, it's quite a long time, but eight years later, jQuery came out. And jQuery kind of revolutionized the way that we developed for the web. Um, in particular, the idea of uh, third-party plugins um, and writing code once and then allowing other people to use it multiple times. It was really a syntax and abstraction from the complex complexities of the browsers. Um, but it was an easy to use tool and people started using it and we saw all kinds of great utilities for it. But nowadays, you know, jQuery gets a bit of a bad rep, but particularly with the, the plugins um, because there's so many of them often a lot of bad ones, maybe very bloated. Um, but we have to keep in mind that that was a really, really awesome thing for the web. Um, it was bloated only really because it was, it was hard to uh, compose sort of all of the, the necessary assets for a particular widget, inject it into your website without it being too coupled to the, to the rest of the site. We began seeing loads of plugins on pages. I don't know if you remember this, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you still have nightmares. But at least, eventually, we started concatenating it. <laughs> but still, um, how do I say it? It was touchy. <laughs> but things like slideshows, modals, calendars, all these kind of widgets, uh, they really shouldn't be rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. Um, we should rewrite them when we're innovating on top of them. But there's a lot of really talented programmers out there writing these things. We should be able to just play, plug and play at any part of our applications. Uh, components should really live in our apps harmoniously, not in the way that we've had it before where we just sort of dump it in and it could mess up, up with our app. Um, and they should be composed of markup styles and scripts. We should get away from the sort of div soup that we've come to know. Not this kind of soup, though, more like this kind of soup. But what if there was a way that we could clean up our markup and, uh, and really build powerful applications that are separated, kind of like Microsoft had originally uh, introduced, um, and maybe be happy with a clean microwave like this young lady? Let's take Ardeo for an example. Um, it's, it's a quite uh, clean code base. I haven't seen necessarily behind the scenes, but their web app, I've looked at through their code. It's pretty nice. They have a good team. Um, but what if it could look something like this? So everything was very compartmentalized and modular. <clears throat> um, but really, that's just kind of a syntax sugar and an oversimplification of the app itself. Um, but it's at the core of what Web Components is trying to do. Uh, it adds semantics. I mean, div soups aren't necessarily uh, very semantic. We had classes, but, um, but I, I like the, the syntactic sugar that uh, custom elements give us. But more importantly, it gives us a custom API so that we can tie into the lifecycle of that element and build procedures around that 
particular custom element. Uh, but most importantly, it, it adds encapsulation. And that is what gives us uh, decoupled mini applications within our entire app. What if our DO, uh, if you looked at the album, the code for the album, it was just wrapped basically in a single element. All you had to do is put an element on the page, and the rest of it was taken care of behind the web component. You could, it could adapt to different settings uh, based on attributes or just where it is in the source code. Um, you could have apps that contain other apps, uh, collections, or just simple you know, buttons might live in several different apps. Um, this would really help testing and debugging. Uh, testing, obviously, easier when the, the code base is smaller and it's decoupled from the rest of the application. And debugging, um, debugging is easier because have you ever tried to debug a giant application you don't know where things are coming from? At least if you can start pulling things out for fairly easily, you can get down to the bug. This all sounds pretty good, right? I mean, Shaq likes it. Um, and I'm sure most of you guys agree with the concept. It's, it's, a, it's nothing new. Um, other platforms have already utilized. OK, I'll wait for you guys. No. Uh, other platforms have other, uh, already started, uh, have already utilized this sort of concept. Um, but what you might be saying is, Dave, don't we already have this? With frameworks like Angular, Ember, React, that, that are building sort of the componentized views, um, really sort of wrapping things together, organizing our code. Um, and even uh, frameworks that are more web components focused, like Polymer or Xtag, don't necessarily rely on a spec in the browser to perform. Well, a wise man once said, tools, libraries, frameworks uh, should all be to improve, um, they should be created to improve upon the core language at hand. It should not supplement it. The language should be held responsible for that. Uh, that was me today, but uh, you're welcome. Um, so, the web component spec is made up of uh, four specs. And along the same lines of the decouplement paradigm, um, it's, they're all fairly decoupled. So they don't re require uh, or custom elements. You don't need HTML templates. Shadow DOM, you don't need HTML templates. They all can be used by themselves. Uh, custom elements is a way to create new uh, or extend existing DOM elements. Um, it's a pretty easy API, and it's, it's pretty nice. Obviously, if we, had a, if we wanted to create a uh, a tag like this, my element. Uh, the code would look something along these lines. We would extend the, uh, the HTML element prototype. Um, we could tie into a bunch of callbacks that happen during the, the life cycle, uh, when it's created, when it's attached to the DOM, when it's detached from the DOM. Uh, when an attribute has changed, um, we'll, we can be aware of those things and make the, the necessary adjustments. Uh, for example, if we are going to build little mini applications built around a, a custom element, we have to build that HTML inside of there. Um, and we would want to do that when the, the, the unique element was created, not necessarily when all of them. We want one particular instance when it was created. Um, let's build the, the DOM. Uh, but obviously, this isn't a good way of building a DOM in a string. It's not maintainable. So that's why HTML templates um, is a spec, and uh, most of you are probably familiar with the, the idea behind HTML templates. It's kind of like handlebars or um, underscore templates, um, but it's built into the browser, and it doesn't have some of those inherent issues um, like loading images when you wouldn't expect to. Uh, and the code's pretty simple. It's just a template tag. You can query that tag just like any other element. Um, it won't be rendered at all. It won't be loaded. Nothing inside of it will be loaded. And it'll create a document fragment for you uh, that you can access at any time. Um, and by doing that, you can uh, you know, clone the node, essentially, and then append it to you, anything. Um, but a good example of that would be in one of your callbacks in the custom element, uh, you could assign that template to the inner HTML. Uh, one neat thing about the template tag is uh, these con con uh, content, um, yeah. content elements. Uh, that essentially allows you to uh, get all of the root elements um, within uh, an element that was created. If you're familiar with like the video tag, you know how you see um, different uh, videos underneath that. 
uh, I forget what it's called, the audio or whatever it is. Um, that essentially gives you, this gives you the ability to go in and grab a uh, child of the root element um, content and inject that into your template. Um, it would look something like this. So at the top, we would, in our DOM, add our custom element. Um, I have a span around jQuery and nothing around conference. Uh, in the template, I add hello. And then I query for uh, the span by doing content selector span. And that's where I'll insert, insert that um, copy. And then below, I just do a catch all for anything left over uh, will get put into that template. So once it gets rendered, the bottom is the output. It'll sell, say, hello, jQuery conference. <coughs> then there's HTML imports, which really allows us to take those, that concept, the custom elements, um, and import them into my R documents. So much like we do with CSS or JavaScript, um, we can do that with HTML imports. Uh, it works pretty simple. In the head, you just use the link tag uh, with uh, a rel of import and point to the HTML file that contains your component. Uh, and then at that point, you can use it anytime in your DOM. You can even create it in JavaScript. The Shadow DOM is one of the most exciting, I think, uh, components that are in the spec. Um, Shadow DOM gives us markup encapsulation and style boundaries. Uh, and it exposes what the browsers have been doing for a while to us as the developers um, to implement these sort of uh, UI paradigms. So for example, if you're using the input type date, you might notice that when you click into it, there's this UI already built out for you. Um, if you haven't looked at your view source recently, you may think that that's just some magical code that shows up. I don't know. But all it really is is a bunch of divs um, that is pre-styled for you, but it has encapsulation, so you can't actually go in and mess it up. Or by injecting this into your application, there's no way that the, the calendar is going to look goofy because you styled your application strangely. To utilize it, again, it's very simple. Um, uh, you just query for any element, and then there's uh, a new create shadow root method that you can run on any of those elements, and that mean, uh, that'll make everything underneath that, um, anything you put in there, encapsulated, including CSS. I don't know if you guys can see this. It might be a little too much, but, um, but this, was, this is basically everything together uh, in an HTML file. Um, you don't need the header or anything like that. It's just an import. Um, but I've got a script that's creating the, uh, the new element uh, called my element. Um, I'm referencing the, imp the, the current script document, the current strict owner document. That'll give you the, essentially the document object of that current import. Um, and then I extend the element. I create a callback, which will then take the, the template that I have below there. Um, and create a, uh, a shadow uh, root and insert that template into the shadow root, and then registers my element. So later, I can then <clears throat> reference it within our HTML, uh, import it, and use it anywhere in, the, in my application. And I get a beautiful UI of Hello jQuery Ref Conference. With, it's red. It's red, guys. <laughs> so obviously, there's a lot of issues. Um, JavaScript dependencies. If you've, if you've done a lot of research into this, there's uh, still a long ways to go um, to really create you know, very complex uh, web component applications without the use of heavy, heavy polyfills. Um, but JavaScript dependencies is probably a top one. Um, we have to make sure that in our imports, if we're importing a ton of third-party applications, that there's not any sort of dependency issues. Um, there are, has been some work, and it does uh, handle that for the most part. But if you're pulling in a bunch of third-party stuff and different versions of the third-party apps, if, if you're using jQuery, different versions of jQuery, that could become an issue. Um, I would like to see, I know there's conversations uh, about this going on, but I'd like to see um, ES6 modules uh, be integrated with web components. That could be really interesting, um, in particular, the idea about wrapping sort of all of that together. Um, and then accessibility issues uh, are an issue, but being worked on. Uh, obviously, cross-browser support 
Um, it's not quite there. It's uh, just about there in Chrome and Opera by default because they're using Blink. Um, Firefox is right, right behind them, which is good. Safari is slow. Uh, hopefully, they'll catch up. And IE, don't have to say anything there. Uh, but luckily, there are polyfills that, that allow you to use web components without um, a cross browser, no problem. Um, uh, for example, platform.js by Polymer will give you that. Um, and X tags, I think, it does that as well. Uh, tomorrow, make sure to check out um, Rod Dotson's uh, uh, multi device apps with web components. He's going to go over some really interesting things with how to use web components and the thing, the the UI widgets that are currently out there um, that you could use, like paper, brick, um, things that Chrome and Firefox have been developing. They're pretty neat. Um, that's at 3.40 tomorrow. So go build web components. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Questions? Nope. Is that a nope? Oh, we got a, we got, we got a live one. <laughs> so a lot of, uh, it seems like what precede this, a lot is like you, you, know, you talked about jQuery plugins. I mean, a common one that I've seen a million implementations of is a select replacer, drop down select replacer. And what they generally do is take the original thing, hide it, and then right. add new thing in the JavaScript and, uh, and replace it in place, and that's kind of a mess. Um, I guess my one, one question is, is this kind of thing, like um, you can only use a web component on a new element, is that true? Or can you sort of find an existing element in the page, for instance, by class or ID, and web componentize that? Yeah, you can extend uh, existing elements and then sort of tie into that API and extend the API. Um, I don't know, like, th there's probably a lot of work to be done to, uh, to completely replace something like a select, um, but I, I think and I hope that that's sort of the goal, is to have complete customization in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the select does sort of use the same paradigm, so um, it shouldn't, we shouldn't be too far from that. Anybody else? Questions like, oh. how did I get so funny? Is anybody using this live right now uh, that you know of? Um, I mean, obviously, like, there's, there's uh, a lot of frameworks that are using the concept and try to moving it into that. Um, obviously, Polymer is using that. So anything built on Polymer would be using these, these specs. Um, do you mean, though, like, completely vanilla? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, some really great examples. There's, there's tons of sites out there. There's like customelements.io. Um, there's paper by, uh, or I think there's another name for it too. I don't know. Paper by Google. Um, Brick by uh, Mozilla. Um, we'll have some really, in, really, really great examples of, of web components. Um, those will be using the polyfills, the you know Polymer or X tags, but, um, but. Those, are, those frameworks are supposed to be closely, closely tied to the spec. Hey, how's it going, Dave? Hey, uh, Rob, what's up? Hey, are you well. going to correct me right now? Well, <laughs> a little. Uh, so about who's using it in production, um, if you go to the GitHub website, GitHub is actually using custom elements in production. So when you look at on a commit message where it says like the time ago, it says like five minutes ago or whatever, that's actually a custom element. And it's actually a type extension element. So they're extending. Uh, a native element to add that behavior to it. And they're using the polyfills from, from Polymer to do that. And also, Salesforce is um, building a lot of production stuff as well using web components. Very so. cool. Thanks, Rob. But are any like projects with like real users using? <laughs> <laughs> um, Anything else? Or are we all set? Are we running out of time? You guys are hungry, aren't you? Yes. <laughs>